by clicking it you can choose one of the preferred languages and i start the recording of our next presentation ladies and gentlemen i'd like to present the next presenter Ms. Oksana Smorzhavska, this is her second presentation, and it is a pleasure. Oksana is the uh, PhD in history and um, associate professor at um, Taras Shevchenko, uh, Kiev National University, and uh, her scope of uh, scientific interests uh, cover uh, religious um, and uh, cultural life in Ukraine, the culture in postmodern Ukraine, commemorative practices and modern culture uh, policy. Uh, and today she will present about Yuri Androhovich and Andrzej Stasiuk, focus in Europe through the eyes of the writers. She will present her historical and cultural analysis. Over to you. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank uh, Mikolov for his interesting presentation, especially regarding uh, the people, because it's important to convey to the people that they do not see Russian occupiers as Russian occupiers would like to depict it during the information warfare. And my presentation probably is related uh, to the informational warfare, the cultural warfare, because it has been quite some years. The war started way before the large scale invasion. I'm not even talking about 2014, I'm talking about way earlier than that. If we're talking about uh, uh, the uh, war happening at the mental level and my today's presentation is a part of a more global project that uh, i have been working on for years which is uh, presenting modern ukrainian literature in europe and first and foremost uh, with the help of our poets and writers uh, who form the cohort of postmodernism uh, literary professionals uh, and uh, officially it is considered that postmodernism ceased to exist in 2010 because then we have started the metal modern era but uh, all of the events demonstrate postmodernism didn't cease to exist it is still relevant. Many aspects of it are still relevant. And I today would like to draw your attention first and foremost uh, to Yuri Androkovich, uh, how he sees Europe. Uh, and also I will partially touch upon Andrzej Stasiuk, the Polish writer. This is the next part of uh, my research because uh, presently I'm focused more on Mr. Androkovich. He was supposed to, to um, have um, uh, a presentation in Lviv recently. I couldn't uh, attend it, but from what I know, it is supposed to be recorded. So to those who are interested, you can uh, find out more about his vision of certain events through the writer's prism. Now I'm going to open a small presentation so that I can show you a few slides uh, and uh, and then we're going to talk about the work with the text. Uh, uh, please give me a second.
перепрошую, другого вантажить. Excuse me, it takes um, me some time to start sharing my screen. Can you see it? No, not yet. Yeah, yeah, now we can see it. We can see it now. Or maybe you would like to open it full screen? Maybe then it will be better. Yeah. How about now? Is it full screen? No, but if you cannot open it full screen, then it's, it's okay. Well, it says that sadly I cannot do that. Oh, it actually worked, right? Okay. So, a few words about how Androhovich himself looked at postmodern. It was written for a conference late 90s. I'm not going to read it out loud. For those who are interested, you can take a look at it. I'm going to move on. So, if we're speaking about cultural diplomacy, it is very important to also take into account the authors, their thoughts, uh, because they impact people's um, opinion about the country that is represented by the author. And today, the relevant thing is appealing to the literature that represents Ukraine in the world that demonstrates a vision of Ukrainian culture and history in the condition of such uh, a hybrid warfare, yet another escalation of information attacks. It is very important uh, to provide answers uh, to all these challenges. For example, we can think about the attempts to change uh, the vector of Ukraine-Poland relationship, these events with the uh, uh, farmers who are trying to speculate the names uh, of different historic personalities uh, that without the unprejudiced analysis uh, can lead to certain unrest in the society or even historians on both sides of the Ukraine-Poland border. That is why I would like to demonstrate the possibilities of cultural cooperation aimed at the constructive dialogue and learning more about cultural, historical, and other peculiarities in development of both Ukrainians and Poles. The history of our relationship is very diverse. Uh, we know uh, we uh, do have um, uh, something that we are unhappy with, but we know that all of this uh, historic memories, manipulation around certain personalities uh, and individuals uh, basically is the bomb the time bomb that can destroy all of the preliminary positive achievements we can Ukraine and Poland in the face of our joint threat, uh, i.e. Russian occupiers. So with the help of the modern Ukrainian literature, ordinary Europeans uh, starting in 2000s had an opportunity to discover Ukraine as a European country with the post-Soviet burden, with mafia, corruption on different levels of the government, on different society levels, lots of everyday challenges, which back in the day uh, seemed to be pretty exotic. Nevertheless, Ukrainian Ukrainians were seen as someone who is uh, still close uh, to uh, people from Europe. And uh, the interest uh, in the modern Ukrainian literature uh, was um, 
uh, motivated uh, by the orange revolution but this interest did not happen um, out of the blue it wasn't something unexpected uh, the poets writers uh, I am um, translators, publishers, and caring people on both sides uh, of this invisible border. We're working hard. Uh, this border between Ukraine and quote unquote Europe. As um, Anhovich mentioned back in the day, we are living uh, in the era of the 13th, unification of Europe. The first one happened during the medieval on the ruins of the Roman Empire, the second one happened in the 18th century when relying on the scientific uh, culture and the third one is happening presently and the biggest uh, difficulty of this procedure is uh, not in as uh, Andrew Hovich wrote and said uniting uh, Europe but rather bringing Central Central Eastern Europe uh, to be the part of it and he's talking about poland uh um serbia romania ukraine etc in ukrainian literature during the soviet times was outside of span of attention of the poles moreover the opinion dominated that everything soviet uh, only had uh, the mark of uh, the uh, soviet propaganda that it is prejudiced ideological so there was no interest uh, even though in Poland people knew uh, about uh, Rostovchenko, Van Krenko, and also Polish readers had an opportunity to find out uh, about um, uh, the Ukrainian Renaissance uh, uh, writers. Uh, and Polish readers uh, also knew about Lina Kostenko poetry, Vasil Simonenko, Vasil Holoborodko, and the so-called bridge between Ukrainian and Polish culture was uh, uh, Suchasny's publishing house. But in fact, there was a very limited uh, number of such uh, um, ties. And starting 1991, the situation did not take a turn for better. The economic crisis back in the day, both in Ukraine and Poland, did not contribute to proper funding in translation domain, in publishing domain, and uh, also there was um, not enough attention paid to making Ukrainian literature popular in Poland and vice versa. But step by step, such ties uh, were established. Polish uh, translator and writer Odan Zadura, uh, who translated Metropolitical's poems uh, in Polish, and he was so interested in Ukrainian literature that he started uh, translating almost uh, all the representatives of Ukrainian modern literature to Polish. Yurandukhovich, Vasil Makhno, Andrei Bogdara, Natalia Bolesrakivska, Stop Slavinsky, Alexander Ivanitsa, Mikola Radchuk, their uh, um, works were published in a book. Also, uh, it was an anthology of Ukrainian poetry that was titled, um, uh, that was dedicated to poems. And it was uh, published a few times and was extremely popular in Poland. If we look at Yuri Andrehovich uh, works and take a look at his vision of uh, Ukraine, Europe, Europeans that can be seen in his essays and novels that were translated and published in Poland and among other countries. I would uh, offer paying attention to the joint project, uh, but as a historian, I also was interested in the novels uh, and uh, army essays, the early prose, uh, that also showed sort of an analysis of the events that he described. Uh, the, the 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, that allowed you to find out more about the post-Soviet country. And the so-called meeting of two cultures uh, in the literary domain was this joint Ukraine-Polish project that was called My Europe, two essays about uh, the 
most ancient part of the world. The idea of it uh, belonged to Monica Schneiderman, uh, the wife of Andrzej Stasiuk, who, who offered uh, as the head of the publishing house, as Andrew Hovich mentioned, uh, without controlling each other and without checking on each other, but at more or less the same timeline, right? Uh, uh, a work dedicated to whatever, dedicated to yourself, to your spot in this world, uh, maybe think about some important uh, for you during that timeline. And Yuri Adrohevich in Ukraine, and Andrzej Stasiuk in Polsha, in Poland, Andrzej Stasiuk in Poland, they were renowned writers, the representatives of the same generation. That is why such a joint work are not simply two essays. This is a so-called view at the same thing, but from different angles. And each of them feeling their own Europe. This book first was published in Poland in 2000. A year later, the Ukrainian translation was presented on Lviv and Kiev. In this book, the authors are looking for Europe in memory, in literature, on the map in themselves. They say by Andrzej Stasiuk uh, that is titled um, Ship's Diary Europe, show something that is uh, in between the uh, land house and the house that hasn't yet been built. And uh, there is a multi-colony Europe, and I'm going to read a very hasty description of Europe by him. The map of Europe reminds um, a certain group, uh, the German uh, patty, the French salad, the Italian asparagus, Spanish dessert, uh, and British comfort. Here and there, everything is covered in spots, so Hungarian sauce, Czech sauce, uh, Romanian egg, Swedish, Norwegian, um, herring, uh, mustard, uh, Polish, uh, uh, spinach, uh, not a bad not a badly mixed dish. And for Yuri Androhovich, Europe was different, starting from the early 90s. Uh, and first, uh, as for the same as for every post-Soviet person, it looked like a fairy tale, something magical, fantastic, amazing, unreachable. The blind love diving into which uh, had front uh, stopped you from seeing any of the flaws. And for Androhovich, this is what Europe looked like in the 90s, in 1992, the contrast between the post-Soviet person in 1992, when you only fly for uh, two hours and come to Europe, but these countries do not exist anymore. And in my opinion, we simply are moving towards each other. The West of Europe is becoming more and more Eastern and vice versa. In 2007, a new publication uh, appeared uh, by Androhovich, and in uh, that uh, literary piece, he describes uh, in a very serious manner uh, the situation and his views on Europe. He makes us think about Europe, what it is and uh, where the borders of Europe are. It is a part of uh, Asia or is it a peninsula? It is something that is hard to restrict. If we clearly know where the Western border lies, uh, we still have a lot of concepts uh, related to its Eastern border. The Eastern border is uh, viewed differently. For some, it is uh, the bank of the Rain River or the uh, uh, Soviet Union that uh, ceased to exist or the Ural and even if we are talking about uh, the oral chain, are we sure that this border lies uh, before or after this uh, chain? 
And you see that uh, for Stasiuk, uh, Europe uh, is uh, viewed uh, from uh, the point of view of culinary impressions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for Yuri Andruhovich, uh, it is uh, viewed uh, completely differently. It looks uh, like uh, something that is uh, covered uh, with the snow from uh, the north, uh, and it is covered uh, with the Sahara sand uh, on the south. When we get to the western part of Europe, uh, that is usually uh, well uh, cared and uh, well maintained. At the same time, it looks uh, too uh, clean, and sometimes I feel like uh, getting drunk and putting it a bit into disorder. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, the eastern part uh, that looks like ruin. You can see that uh, there are drafts over there. You see that there are some issues uh, with uh, the um, water supplies and utilities. At the same time, Europe is amazing because it still mentions to speak many languages. It is a resource. It is a myriad of stories uh, that are told in uh, thousands of dialects. The border of uh, Europe lies uh, where the uh, local citizens believe uh, it lies. But uh, the author thinks uh, that uh, Europe is different and Central Europe is viewed differently. The Central Europe is uh, viewed as uh, something that is between the two threats, uh, the Germans and the Russians. The, uh, that part, and the, uh, the central part uh, is afraid of uh, Germans and ethnic cleansing. And, uh, they are afraid also of, of uh, Russians. It is good that the rest heal uh, the Americans that will come uh, to uh, our uh, to uh, our rescue. At the same time, uh, we can also uh, refer to Milan Kundera, who wrote an article uh, and that was called "The Tragedy of the Central Europe." And in that uh, article, uh, he was uh, thinking about, he was uh, deliberating about uh, the vision of uh, Europe for Czech, uh, Poles, uh, and other citizens of Central Europe. But uh, Kundera remembers uh, well uh, that uh, uh, the Central Europe was uh, always uh, divided. Uh, part of it was uh, guided by the Catholic Church, and the other part was uh, mostly focused on the Byzantine world. After 1945, uh, the border between two Europes was uh, extended to the east, and uh, some of the states that used to be the Western in uh, one day it uh, turned out uh, to be the Eastern European state. The uh, were changes in the situation in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe uh, in, and in the Western part. Geographically speaking, the central part of Europe has sustained the biggest shift. The main threat uh, for the Central Europe, according to Kundera, was uh, Russia. According uh, to Palatsky, a historian of Palatsky, uh, he wrote uh, that uh, Russia is uh, putting a threat uh, to any Western country. According to his views, uh, with regard to the prospect uh, of uh, the nations, each nation has to respect uh, the neighboring nations. The united uh, Europe uh, could uh, be uh, could become a unit, uh, and uh, they also viewed uh, Russia as uh, an, a threat. 
as Russia was uh, trying to turn um, the um, ethnicities of, of uh, its empire into one nation, the Soviet nation. Getting back uh, to the Central Eastern Revision uh, by Andrukovich uh, that uh, was uh, written in 1998, uh, and uh, it was uh, published in 2000, uh, we should uh, focus on the history. There uh, are few main points uh, that uh, require our attention. Uh, there are happy communities, uh, for instance, located in the north of Europe, Sweden, for instance, and unhappy nations who had to sustain the impact of uh, the uh, Russian Empire and Soviet Union. According to Andrukovic, uh, there are different communities from the point of view of a mindset in Western Europe. The other has been ironic in terms of uh, the meetings between Western and Eastern intellectuals at the beginning of the 90s. When they got together, they talked about uh, the deconstruction of the Berlin War. They talked about uh, the all nationalists. Uh, they talked about virtuality in um, Europe in uh, the third uh, millennium. But uh, at the same time, these debates were not heated uh, enough. Uh, they were just uh, comfortable conversations uh, held uh, in uh, cafes of the Western Europe. The uh, anti-political views uh, are not uh, stirring anyone's views. Uh, they are not very much disturbed uh, by Marine Le Pen. They are not uh, disturbed uh, by Jirinovsky, uh, and uh, they are not scared of uh, Milosevic uh, in uh, present days. At the same time, he is describing the future of uh, the Western intellectuals and happy and unhappy communities. For happy communities, history does not pertain high value, and uh, it is not the source of uh, looking for meaning in life. Meanwhile, unhappy communities are clinging to their past, which they use as a guide for their mindset and identity. Therefore, despite globalization, despite integration processes, Europe, according to Yuri Andrukovic, remains fragmented uh, from a point of view of uh, culture and mindset. Iranians and Albanians uh, live in different cultural uh, media and uh, they are not united. Therefore, we see that the views that uh, were voiced uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago may seem outdated today. But in my view, they have become even more relevant today since they are mostly focused on looking for something that would unite us, Ukrainians. And it might help us to reintegrate into the European cultural base. Thank you for your attention. And uh, this is just a part of uh, my bigger research. Thank you very much, Oksana, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Today, we have uh, this uh, highly relevant presentations. Uh, and McCollum mentioned uh, cultural uh, diplomacy, uh, which uh, reminded me of uh, Tina Berisunka's uh, presentation on Chadrick. Dear colleagues, now I will open the floor for discussion. Let us deliberate a bit on the topic of cultural diplomacy. What is your view of the cultural diplomacy? You showed us uh, your um, opinion um, 
from the uh, perspective of uh, these literary pieces and uh, these uh, discussions uh, 20 years uh, ago and how that topic uh, uh, been used uh, in currently among the writers. Maybe you have heard that uh, Oksana Zabushka was invited uh, to join uh, the lineup uh, of a jury in the cinema contest. And it caused a lot of debate uh, since uh, she has no experience in cinema. Therefore, there are people who are the leaders uh, and who are people of authority whose opinion matters. And Oksana Zabushko is among those people. For those people who do not know much about Ukraine or who perceive Ukraine from pro-Russian narratives, the more information from Ukrainians they get, including Ukrainian writers, Ukrainian artists, Ukrainian sculptors, Ukrainian architects, uh, Ukrainian singers, uh, as uh, we see a lot of uh, discussions around the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, the better it is for our country. I believe that we have uh, to tap on all the resources available, especially from the point of view of uh, literature and culture. It is our job to show our perspective. It is our job to convey our views and not to leave the blank spaces for the occupiers to fill in. As uh, the war, of course, the act of uh, hostilities, um, this is the front line, this is uh, the warfare, but still we see that uh, the uh, Risa, the war for winning hearts and minds, and uh, that is a lengthy effort uh, that could last for generations, and we should all contribute to, to uh, it in terms of shaping uh, positive image for Ukraine. Thank you, Oksana. Yes, I totally agree. I believe that uh, this opinion that we should uh, uh, listen to the Ukrainian researchers now, it matters a lot. I fully agree with you, as when we talk about decolonization, you will see it differently, as some believe that this is just about uh, the Russian history or Russian literature being banned or Slavic studies. Well, I believe that it is important not simply to listen to Ukrainian researchers now, but also uh, to um, take their opinions into due consideration, not simply to give them platform for raising their voices. As uh, often we hear that um, uh, some opinions are very much uh, biased when it comes to Ukraine. Nadia, you raise your hand. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana, for your presentation. Thank you for making this comparison of uh, the text uh, of uh, two writers, uh, these esteemed writers uh, that are famous both in Ukraine and in Poland. Maybe you have heard about another project um, that uh, was uh, run in uh, 2014. Les Belay and Lukas Trutak uh, published um, a book uh, that was called Asymmetric Symmetry, a field research in uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations. Even uh, when, from the title, uh, the field research, we see the reference uh, to the book uh, by Oksana Zabushka. And uh, 
uh, Lukas Belay uh, is, I'm sorry, Lesh, Lesh uh, Belay uh, went uh, to Ukrainian cities and Lukas Andrzejczak went to Polish cities. They uh, both uh, visited uh, 10 cities in each country and uh, they asked questions uh, about attitudes uh, to the neighboring nation. They asked also about uh, the history and culture. And uh, they also had uh, very interesting stories to tell about everyday life of the citizens. And this book is peculiar because it has been published in two languages at the same time, Polish and Ukrainian. I um, believe that it uh, could be partially only compared uh, to the research of Andrukovic and Stasuka, as uh, we are talking about different generation. 15 years apart, uh, many events took place in the European Union and in Ukraine in the meantime. But do you have any ideas uh, in terms of uh, drawing parallels uh, with this uh, project? Thank you, Nadia, for this idea. As of now, I am still running some comparative studies and uh, I'm focused uh, not only on Ukrainian Polish uh, projects, uh, but other projects as well. And of course, I would like to encompass as uh, many research areas as possible, but unfortunately, I'm limited in time. But of course, it would be very exciting to run um, this kind of project and to, to compare 90s and uh, later years. Uh, it would be very interesting to see the trends. We see that uh, there are some issues um, with uh, Oksana's uh, connection. Let's uh, wait a bit. Maybe she will be able to rejoin. Well, colleagues, we can proceed with the discussion. This is an extremely interesting topic and cross-disciplinary. And this is basically what we're doing with this cohort. Maybe you have any opinions, comments, maybe somebody else would like to chime in, share their ideas and thoughts. Sure, Irina, go ahead. It's good to see everyone. Well, it is not idea or a thought but something to add because i think that this kind of cultural interaction maybe we see them better when we can also uh, talk about different types of art and what matters a lot to me is that thanks to our summoners uh, i am shaping and framing a very comprehensive picture of this interaction i wanted to add that uh, I think it is very important to see these ties between Ukrainian and Polish culture at the level of academic music, because uh, there are such ties between Ukraine and Poland, but they are pretty old. We can talk back from the Soviet days uh, when even our researchers and our um, people from the sphere of music also were going there and they wanted to go there as Ukrainians because they know that all the decisions were made in Moscow, the decisions that pertain to that. And now these initiatives are becoming larger and larger. In 2020, when we were all living in Zoom, there was an amazing Polish-Ukrainian project that was titled Pandemic Music uh, Space. It was a very specific uh, electronic music, different pieces uh, that reflected uh, us when we were in this pandemic vacuum. And it was a collaboration uh, of the Ukrainian Association of Electroacoustic Music and the Polish counterpart. When the large scale invasion started, uh, large Polish festivals uh, and groups uh, 
are asking Ukrainian composers for their pieces, and there are lots of them that premiered, and that one way or another are dedicated to war. And they, pre they premiere, for example, there is an imaging project that started back in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, 50s of the previous uh, century, the Warsaw Fall, a festival of the avant-garde modern music. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, in fall uh, 2022, this festival wanted to see lots of uh, pieces uh, by Ukrainian composers such as Ayevich and Frolak. And there were also other premieres, Polish colleagues in music, in academic music, are very supportive of us. And uh, for example, for me, it was what, hard to say, maybe it was a very pleasant thing to me, that for example, in Poland, musicians supported uh, the position of canceling Russian culture. And they refused from performing on all levels the music that originates from Russia. And you know, uh, this means large projects uh, that take years uh, um, to prepare for. And for example, if you're refusing to perform Russian opera, we also understand uh, that also there is big money behind it. So you have to be pretty courageous to do that. And from what I know, the Poles and Lithuanians refused from it as well. And this is how they are culturally supporting Ukraine. And I think that this kind of interaction uh, and as uh, Ksana said, it is very important to emphasize it, and it demonstrates uh, different domains uh, that uh, can be supported. And the demonstration of Ukrainian culture, different culture, and it is also very important at the same time uh, for it to be modern culture. So that uh, it would show you something that is typical for the European and American culture. For example, this week uh, in Ohio, in the US, at uh, the University of Columbus, there will be a festival. I think it's titled Now. And they invited uh, a composer, uh, Alaza Haikevich, for one week. And they're going to emphasize Ukrainian music, Ukrainian culture. These are my uh, colleagues, and it's very nice that they are focusing on the Ukrainian culture. It's at the heart of it. Thank you so much, Irina. Thank you for this commentary. Oksana is back, but as you have started raising this, maybe you could mention a few words uh, um, about the project that you're working at the University of Indiana. Thank you, Svetlana. Well, I wanted to say and uh, thank uh, Helena Holberg, who in such a way decided to support Ukraine. And the thing is that uh, uh, if, if something is wrong, Svetlana, please correct me. The thing is that the students at the University of Indiana will be performing an opera by a well-known Russian composer who is the flagship of Russian culture, whose music uh, is played instead of the Russian anthem during uh, the Olympics. We're talking about uh, Petro Tchaikovsky. And this is a project that took a lot of time. They cannot cancel it. And uh, Yevgeny Anegin will be performed uh, in the University of Indiana. And uh, Helena Goldberg with her colleagues decided that there should be something else aside from this project. And uh, it is impossible to perform Ukrainian uh, opera because of the lack of uh, funds and time. Uh, Helena offered uh, a Ukrainian art song project. And uh, a very important thing is that in the heart of this project uh, will be the students singing. And in such a way, Ukrainian music, Ukrainian culture as such, because uh, there will, will be an amazing poster 
uh, with Alexander Axter's illustration that Ukrainian music is uh, introduced to the students, to the younger generation, that is not being imposed on them because there was a selection of the composers and pieces and each and every student can pick and choose whatever there is that they are fond, that they are fond of. So uh, this way of uh, learning about different music is it something that you prefer, something that is easier for you to sing and perform is very important. And it is amazing that uh, there is uh, such a powerful uh, group uh, of uh, a team who are working on this project because Svetlana also forms part of this group. And this is how Ukrainian culture is represented. And I would like to also add, if I may, it seems to me that uh, the university in this project, the University of Indiana is letting us uh, to also give guest lectures for the students. Because it seems to me that this kind of uh, direct communication with a person who now is in Kiev uh, with the students also provides them with some additional information and additional emotional, so to say, direction. Because uh, thanks to interest of uh, Ort Hilevich, I had this kind of a lecture with the students uh, of the university and uh, the first question was uh, how is it living there now has it taken a turn for worse or for better so the first questions are not even professional ones but you know the first questions are more about very alive emotional interest to the people that they see because they see this uh, person that is talking to them all the way from there and they understand that there is some different reality. And I think that it is very, very important because I had one more guest lecture in a different university and the reaction was the same. You know, first some very everyday um, questions and then some professional and type of questions. But I think that this kind of an emotional first uh, contact is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Oksana, welcome back, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Sadly, there are some repair works going on, and sometimes I lose my connectivity. I don't know what I missed. Well, we didn't hear your commentary regarding what Nadia said. I was saying that for this project that she mentioned, I didn't work with it yet but it is very important when it comes to comparing the writers from different generations different times the 90s 2000s and modern day comparing them well not only in terms of ukraine and poland we can also look at other countries and create a cultural map a cultural map with ukraine present on this map i think it is something that can have a future. And uh, lots of people were engaged from and involved from different countries, and it is a cross-disciplinary approach. Historians, philologists, culturologists, sociologists, uh, I think that everyone will have a say from their perspective, from their angle. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I wanted to add to what you have just mentioned about cross-disciplinarity. And uh, you're also a historian. And could you please tell us more about how did you even start working on this project uh, about Androhovich and Stasiuk? You also mentioned Kundera. And you said that it is a part of a larger research. And could you please let us know more about it? I teach masters, and it's called uh, cultural uh, domain of the postmodern Ukraine. And uh, it is pretty visible in Ukraine, but uh, this is only part of it because there is uh, postmodernism cinematography. There is also a powerful uh, philosophy domain. 
not only European, also American, also postmodern tendencies in architecture, pretty broad one. Uh, also, you can see it in our behavior, in our worldview, in our vocabulary. And I'm trying to take all of it together. I'm studying it and students like it a lot. They say that it is so cool that there is uh, such a course that is about us. You know, it's not about something age and not about the uh, ancient Egypt times, but it is about the present day, about their lives, the lives of their parents. Uh, and this is a very popular course. Uh, and students select it year after year. People who major in uh, different uh, subjects. We have seminars dedicated to different topics, and I'm trying to adjust it every year depending on the situation. That is why it is only a part of the project. First and foremost, I am interested in this literature. I discovered it uh, back when uh, it was only appearing, and I was reading the prose and poetry. And yes, some people think that it is an amazing literature. Other people think that it is very primitive. Well, many men, many mind. And it is the same among the researchers and scholars. There are people who are completely against postmodernism. Uh, for example, Oksana Pahlotko thinks that uh, it is uh, showing you all of the low uh, and vulgar instincts uh, on the other hand, there are people who think that it reflects the time, the period. And Andrew Hovich said that it is hard to write about something that you live in. When you're within a bubble, it is pretty subjective. It's hard to be objective and assess and evaluate it objectively. Nevertheless, I can tell from the research by theologists and historians and philosophers uh, that there is yet another wave of going back to that period uh, analysis uh, and also drawing some parallels with the present day. And uh, also there is um, a lot being mentioned about the um, modern warfare, the postmodernist warfare, the Russia-Ukraine war. Starting in 2015, it has been mentioned a lot, the postmodernist uh, warfare regarding Ukraine and Russia that is I mean, more from political science, a global thing. So if someone is interested, uh, we can unite our efforts and we can work on it together. Thank you so much, Oksana. And uh, yes, maybe there are people who would like to join our discussion, who would like to say a few words. We have a couple more minutes. Are there any questions or commentary? Thoughts regarding today's presentation regarding the project that was just suggested by Oksana? No? Well, I guess everyone is already tired. It's the end of the day. Already had three lectures today. There is one more that's going to start in three minutes. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Oksana, for such an interesting and relevant up to date presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, thanks to our interpreters who were with us. And I wish you a pleasant evening. See you on Thursday during our next seminar. I hope that you will be able to join us. Thank you. All the best. <laughs>